1995, I recorded Robert Lenkiewicz at Plymouth College of Art and Design doing a lecture on art. On the 5th of October 2017, I managed to salvage the Lenkiewicz tapes from SVHS. Sorry about the quality, but the curator was Brian Preston and notice a young Nick. Ancient and medieval theories of beauty were undifferentiated from other fields of inquiry. Modern and contemporary theories are clearly defined. And beginning with Baumgarten, who in 1750 published his work Aesthetica. And that would have been that he was trying to study aesthetics and independent science. Aesthetics for the Greeks meant to perceive or apprehend through the senses. In Carton's term, aesthetica would have meant science dealing with sense perception. But clearly the concept of aesthetics as the science of sense perception is not what we nowadays regard as aesthetics. Baumgarten is obviously saying that beauty is the subject of this science of aesthetics. It is something which is sensorily perceived. Baumgarten, like Descartes and Spinoza, was a rationalist. So we would expect him to hold the rationalist views on aesthetics generally shared by all ancient and medieval philosophers, beginning with Plato and Aristotle, and that view was that beauty was objective out there. This flower was beautiful. My attitude to it made no difference. Beauty was objective, out there, like an energy force, like electricity, ground. Objective beauty, being the proper object of the rational intellect, is a common doctrine of the great early thinkers. They felt that beauty was only actually know. But Baumgarten, extending the theories of thinkers like Descartes and Leibniz, came to hold the view that is rational. No. Use not, for example, sensory images. Whereas Specialization. One soon wonders what, if anything, ties all these areas together. Looking at our subject historically can be helpful, but it is manifestly vast. The entire pre Socratic period has as its most influential representative. He observed certain patterns and number relationships occurring in nature. We know that he was interested in the dependence on <coughs> length of the pitch of a note emitted by a vibrating string. The explanation of the harmony of nature was for Pythagoras to be found in the science of numbers. He speculated that harmonious sounds were vibrated by the heavenly bodies as they described their celestial orbits, the music of the spheres. It was believed that number, ratio, were the secret. Geometric proportion, whether expressed in music, poetry, a building, or a universe, was a mirror, a subtle reflection of an abstract order, an insight into God's brain. The Pythagoreans developed a taste for mysteries. Special significance was attached to certain geometric forms, in particular the five platonic bodies. The last of these, known as the dodecahedron, <coughs> and it was particularly popular with its twelve pentagon planes united. It 
was Plato's fifth essence symbolizing the heavens. The pentagram was used by the Pythagoreans as a symbol of recognition between members of their brotherhood and was called by them Hellas. That's what the pentagram meant at the time. There's a pentagram, pentagon. <coughs> And it was believed not only by Pythagoras, but by a number of later Hermetic philosophers that the ten points, one, two, four, five, are achieved by inscribing a line, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The interesting thing is that another pentagon appears inside, upside down. And you can do that again. And there it is, reverse again. And you can do it again. And there it is, upside down again. Quite trivial so far. However, there was an ideal proportion which they called the harmonic mean or the golden section. Leonardo da Vinci was interested in it. The Mona Lisa is constructed out of seven of them. There are at least 11 of them in every Raphael painting. It's completely traditional right up to the 18th century. Come inside, I think. So if you imagine this is divided <coughs> into eight sections, view was that the third point in the harmonic I felt comfortable to why it was produced so long. And that the greater part the greater part is the greater part to the lesser part is found in every one of these ratios. Every single one of these ratios will have that proportion. Even larger versions of it. The scale of this in relation to that pentagon, in relation to that pentagon, in relation to that pentagon, is the same proportion. The construction of the golden rectangle probably the most popular form of this ratio, contains properties that have fascinated the creative for centuries, from the Parthenon to Leonardo, from Kepler to contemporary scientists. This is a fairly conventional geometric formula that we need to be explained. Leonardo da Vinci believed that branches came off the trees at a spiralic ratio directly proportional, proportional to, the, to this reason, that snail shells had that kind of proportion, that waves came in onto the seashore at that kind of proportion. 13th century, the mathematician Fibonacci, it was called the Fibonacci series, 1 plus 1 equals 2, 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, 3 plus 8 equals 13. There's a ratio there as it builds up proportional to the same geometric formula. Pythagoras believed that mathematics is the foundation of the intelligible world and of the invisible world. Spirit and matter. Proportions have therefore, like ideas, an autonomous existence. They are the consequences of the arithmetical, geometric, or harmonic means extolled by Pythagoras and Plato, and are derived from the very nature of number. It follows, according to this view, that every line, every surface, every volume, whose elements are arranged in conformity with these proportions, reflect the idea of beauty. <coughs> beauty would rest on objective foundations independent even of man. When Pythagoras had proved his great theorem, 
He offered a hundred oxen to the muses in thanks for the inspiration and in the belief that he had the key to the structure of, the, of nature itself. I remember someone um, referring me to a book which describes a temple in Turkey, it's supposed to be there now. And as you walked in, it had a certain height and a certain width. And each of the pillars that supported the enormous ceiling <coughs> were a certain width and a certain height. The texture of the stonework on the inside was of a particular, a particular character. The quality of the white stain was of a particular tone and a particular saturation. The spaces in between the pillars were of a particular proportion. And all of this was designed in such a way that whoever walked in, no matter what culture they came from, would start to cry. The claim was that the structure of the building, a building constructed in the 13th and 14th century, over a period of 100 years, would evoke this particular state of mind. Obviously, a preparatory state for worship or humility. Okay, sounds a bit extreme and eccentric and let's relegate the notion to poetry. But we're all familiar with the atmosphere of cathedrals and dark <coughs> night skies and flat seas. We know that a particular atmosphere, a particular set of relationships in relation to our own scale evokes an immediate atmosphere. I remember when I was younger, I saw the engraving by Dura called Melancholia. You may be familiar with it. He did a series of them. Dura, German painter, remarkable draftsman, and etcher. <coughs> and it, there appears a typical magic square in which fascinated followers of number six. We can see how each horizontal and vertical line As do the long diagonals, so they all add up to 34, and if you divide it into sections of four, each of those add up to 34. This patterning delighted many a philosopher, alchemist, and magus. It excited them as an insight into the notion that the structure of matter and the mind of God were linked and could be measured. After Pythagoras, Plato and Aristotle made observations in the field of psychological aesthetics. They stressed the importance of ethics by concepts such as the beauty of virtue and so on. When I was 12, I was given a telescope and I took it into the bedroom and I aimed it at the moon. But I was too frightened to look through because it was just something so dramatic and powerful about this vast thing looking so small in the distance. And I remember getting quite a distance away from the eyepiece and just walking past and looking because I was frightened of the dramatic increase of scale. A change of scale, suddenly you see a tiny detail. It took me some time to just look through. And I had a similar sensation with this wonderful woodcut which shows a pilgrim leaving the earth behind him, <coughs> the sun rising and setting his way below him, <coughs> Even the stars are below him. He climbs the highest peak and somehow breaks through the heavenly spheres and sees the very cogs of nature working the grand system. Delightful early medieval image. The centuries pass. We find Vitruvius and St. Augustine, Philo and Alexandria, followed by the church fathers and medieval schoolmen. I'm talking about the history of beauty. All of whom evolved fascinating and eccentric aesthetic studies. Trinitarian aesthetics, <coughs> Christological aesthetics, charismatic aesthetics, aesthetic, Mariological aesthetics, Virgin Mary cults, and endless theological variations. In the light of this range of aesthetic inquiry, touched upon before the dawn of the Renaissance, it is no wonder that the next few centuries 
produce. Instead, they deepened, enlarged, and enriched the various branches that had emerged from ancient and medieval times. As the centuries passed, specialized areas began to dominate. Sociological aesthetics, special psychological aesthetics, cultural aesthetics, new theories about light, color, form, acoustical aesthetics, therapeutic phenomenological aesthetics, and so on. Here we come to the first essential feature of the history of aesthetic theory, and it is this. Ancient and medieval thinkers writing on aesthetics were all aesthetic objectivists. <coughs> they thought beauty was out there. Whereas a large proportion of modern and contemporary philosophers and aestheticians are skeptics or aesthetic subjectivists. Early and medieval giants like Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, and St. Thomas Aquinas all trusted their senses and reason, taking the existence of beauty for granted, rarely trying to offer any proof for it who was out there, in God, in nature, in numbers. With the dawn of modern thought, such speculations withered away. Baruch Spinoza, David Hume, Immanuel Kant, followed by an uninterrupted line of European and American aestheticians, doubted or denied the objective reality of beauty. They doubted this in a variety of ways, but shared the view that beauty was not necessarily out there. To be compared to the Apollonia, the eternal and original artistic power that first caused the whole world of phenomena into existence. And it is only in the midst of this world that a new transfiguring illusion becomes necessary in order to keep the animated world of individuation. If we could imagine dissonance become mad, and what else is mad? <coughs> this dissonance, to be able to live, would need a splendid illusion that would cover dissonance with a veil of beauty. This is the true artistic aim of Apollo, in whose name we comprehend all those countless illusions of the beauty of mere appearance, that at every moment it's like worth living at all. These two drives unfold their powers in a strict proportion, according to the law of eternal justice. In the 18th century, it might have been called neoclassicism and romanticism. According to Professor Einstein, now we might call it the right and left side of the brain. These dual always seem to have variations on theme throughout the culture. The Greeks knew it better. That this effect should be necessary, everybody should be able to feel most assuredly by means of intuition, provided he has ever felt, if only in a dream, that he was carried back into an ancient Greek existence, walking under lofty ionic colonnades looking up towards a horizon that was cut off by pure and noble lines, finding reflections of his own transfigured shape in the shining marble at his side, and all around him solemnly striding or delicately moving human beings speaking with harmonious voices in a rhythmic language of gesture. To a man in such a mood, however, an old Athenian looking up at him with the sublime eyes of Aeschylus might reply, but say this too, curious stranger, how much did this people have to suffer to be able to become so beautiful? Nietzsche on, everything changes, 
because it starts becoming extremely specialized. It's no longer dealing with ideas as such. It gets broken down in terms of language itself. And people like Wittgenstein in a different kind of way, Derrida, and most of the what are now called deconstructionist thinkers, um, have require such a level of initiation that it's very difficult to, to popularize the ideas. It's very difficult indeed. One tries, but it doesn't make much sense. So I prefer to leave you alone. Indeed, as Wittgenstein said at the end of the tractate, it's that which you cannot speak of. This video salvaged in memory of Robert Oscar Lenkiewicz. Thanks to Plymouth College of Art and Design, 1995, Brian Preston and Nick. This has been a Crystal Murfield video production, 2017. You can contact me at ccsphoto12 at hotmail.com. And if you can help to sponsor my videos, you can pay me at ccsphoto1 at gmail.com. Thanks for watching the video. It's a lifestyle thing. It's valuable.